MatPat, 70 kilograms, Laptop, 2 kilograms, Diet Coke, 5 cans, and trace amounts of 12 other elements. What's that? An episode of Film Theory. <laughs> Welcome to Film Theory, where, let's be honest, who doesn't have a crush on Winry, right? I can't be the only one. So back in our Walking Dead episode last December, I asked you guys one simple question. Little did I know it was going to be one of the most divisive, hate-filled, drama-inducing questions to ever be asked on YouTube. Did you want an episode about Sword Art Online or Full Metal Alchemist? Let me tell you, it was the anime equivalent of World War III, reaching Marvel vs. DC levels of aggression in the comments. Over 200,000 of you voted, and by a margin of only 10,000 votes, FMA took the day. And so here we are. That being said, if you haven't seen the series, why not? It's widely considered to be one of the best, most important animes of all time. Granted, I'll be filling you in on the main details here, but be warned, there are some minor spoilers ahead. So you guys had spoken, but what to do it on? There's so many good topics here. It's a show with everything from living suits of armor to parallel alternate universes with different scientific fundamentals, to a main character with an irrational fear of milk. I debated across all kinds of great topics for this first theory on Full Metal, literally looking at every part of the franchise, from the two anime series, the manga, the movies, the ridiculously adorable Alphonse hat collections, and in all honesty, it's a series I'm gonna want to visit a few more times. I mean, would you look at these things? There is clearly a theory here about how cute they are. Maybe for, like, fashion theory. But before we get into the multi-dimensional, element-bending, homunculi-ridden theory, we have to start with the fundamentals, the inciting action for literally everything that happens in the series. Human transmutation, and the one big mistake that seals Ed and Elle's fates. Full Metal Alchemist has been lying to us for years, and it's not about the importance of a soul or the girth of Major Armstrong's right bicep. It's something much simpler, and simultaneously something much more important. Now in the 2003 version of the Full Metal Alchemist series, which is the one I'm going to focus on today, we learn early on that Ed and Al were both prodigies in the art of alchemy, the science of understanding the atomic makeup of materials, breaking those materials down, then reshaping the components into a new form. Probably the most common example from the show is taking a metal arm and turning it into a metal blade. Most of their early alchemy lessons came from their dad, but not their actual dad, because, you know, he was a total deadbeat, but their dad's library. And the best, or worst volume in old Hohenheim's collection is his book on human transmutation, a forbidden art in the alchemy world. So good job, Dad. You leave your book on the most taboo subject in all of alchemy lying around your house with your two kids, who basically have zero supervision because you're off doing whatever and their mom seems to constantly be hanging up laundry outside. Like seriously, woman, are there really that many clothes to launder? Anyway, the inciting incident to the whole series is when Ed and Al's mother dies at the hands of the laundry gods, I guess, and they try to use human transmutation to bring her back to life. Needless to say doesn't go all that well. Ed loses a leg, Al loses his whole body, and instead of mom, they create... this. <laughs> Worst Mother's Day ever. And this, in turn, prompts the rest of the series, as the two boys try to get their bodies back together. But hold on, why did things go wrong in the first place? Why did their attempt at transmuting mom fail so horribly? The show would have you believe it's because the soul is priceless and that there's no equivalent exchange for it. I would have you believe that that is crap. The solution is much simpler than that. They had the wrong formula. You heard me right. The recipe for human transmutation that we hear Ed recite over... Water. 35 liters and over carbon 20 kilograms and over ammonia 4 liters throughout the series is just plain wrong sir wrong so today I'm correcting that mistake and showing you what our buddies Ed and Al should have done before they went off resurrecting mom double checking their math looks like old Hohenheim of light wasn't the brightest bulb in the box get it Hohenheim of light bulb it's a light 
Oh, what am I doing with my life? So in full metal, alchemy relies on conservation of mass, which is why everything is in units of grams and kilograms. But when it comes to creating a human, you need to get a little bit more specific than that. A little bit more chemistry y. And if you're like everyone in Full Metal Alchemist and haven't had a sophomore chemistry class, well, get ready to get your science on, my friends. Based on the lore of Full Metal Alchemist, we know that the humans in the world of the show are meant to be the same humans in our world. As such, we can actually use real science, like chemistry, from over on this side of the gate to correct the fictional alchemy mistakes that they make over yonder way. And it just so happens that over on this side, we have accurate measurements of the composition of the human body originally generated by the U.S. Bureau of Chemicals and Soil, which, yes, used to be a real U.S. department. Truly, this was a department for people who want to work in the government but didn't want that flashy lifestyle of the DMV. Anyway, they've broken down the human body into the elemental masses it contains. Great! We can just check these figures against Ed's calculations and- Are you kidding me? Ugh, it's never easy! The U.S. Bureau of Chemicals and Soils break them down by elements. But that's a problem because for Ed's calculations, he sometimes uses an element, like phosphorus, and other times he uses a molecule, like salt, which is two elements together, sodium and chlorine, NaCl. But okay, if I can figure out the fictional height of Chun-Li, I can get around this little hurdle. All I need to do is break down the components Ed uses into its respective elements. Then run the math and come up with the amount of each element the series says you need to cook up a healthy helping of human. We then compare that with reality and get our answer. So step one is to get all Ed's fun list of human ingredients into grams. Ed, though, also can't seem to decide if he wants to work in units of volume or in mass. So he puts water and ammonia into liters and everything else into grams and kilograms. That's lame, but whatever, it's an easy fix by running both of those through converters. Great, now we have grams of everything on Ed's list, but we need to convert them from the weight of molecules into the weight of the raw elements they contain. To do that, we have to do more than just add and subtract. That's right, ladies and gentlemen gentlemen, we will have to multiply and divide. Hold on to your auto mail, here we go. You see, in order to compare our two lists, we need to get the number of grams for certain elements in our body. But Hohenheim's list in the show mixes pure elements with compounds like water and saltpeter, making our job a bit more complicated. To get from grams of a compound to grams of an element, we have to use our empirical formulas. These formulas basically help you do math on a molecular level because when you're talking about atoms in a molecule, you have to talk about the number of atoms before you can even start talking about mass. It's actually something that FMA completely glosses over. But think about it like this. I have 10 kilograms of hamburgers. Each one has one patty and two buns. I'm a manly man looking to get my hashtag gains on, so I want to know how much of that 10 kilograms is just the meat. Protein bra! Well, to get there, first I have to know the weight of the beef in one patty for one burger. Then I can figure out how much meat I'm packing by finding the percent of the total hamburger that's just meat, and applying that percentage to the whole 10 kilograms of burger goodness. Ah, oh, McDonald's, you sound so good right now. Hashtag Hashtag not sponsored, but hashtag could be sponsored. McDonald's. Anyway, the same thing applies to the Elric list. Think of our water molecule H2O as the hamburger of the chemistry world, where the oxygen is the beefy center and the hydrogens are our buns. Ed says that we need 35,000 grams of water to create a human, but how many grams of hydrogen do I have versus grams of oxygen? Well, just like needing to know the number of burger patties I had, we need to know how many atoms we have of each element since a hydrogen atom weighs a lot less than an oxygen atom. And because this is chemistry and not a bar barbecue, we have to do all that in molecular terms. To do that, we'll be using moles, a word that's probably causing some of you watching to have PTSD from your high school science days. Hey, at least I'm not bringing up sig figs, right? A mole is a word chemists use instead of a really big number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd power. It's like if a baker says a dozen, we know he means 12, unless he's referring to a baker's dozen, in which case he means 13, and making this a kind of bad example. If a chemist says a mole, they mean 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Seriously, science, this is why people take women's studies majors in college. For every element, there's a molar mass for that element, which is the number of moles in a single gram of it. It sounds complicated, but it's just a ratio that lets you flip back and forth between grams and moles whenever you're solving problems like this. So here's how we're gonna use it. We start with grams of a compound like H2O, then we turn it into moles using our ratio for molar mass. Where did we get this random number for the molar mass of water? You can calculate it by using the periodic table, 
or you can just look it up on Google. I'll let you guess which one I did. For water, our magic molar mass ratio is 18.02 grams per mole. We put in Edward's 35,000 grams of water from his list and multiply by one mole over 18.02 grams of water to get 1,942.3 moles of water. That takes us from the weight of our water to the number of water molecules we have. Now we have to calculate how many hydrogens we have so we can figure out how much those guys weigh. This time we use the molar mass for each individual element, which again, I of course used the periodic table for, <coughs> not Google at all. <coughs> for water, the two hydrogens take up only 11% of the molar mass, and oxygen takes up 89%. Knowing that, we calculate 11% of 1942.3 to get 213.65 moles of hydrogen and 1728.63 moles of oxygen. And just so you know, I didn't just do this with water. I did it for the salt, the saltpeter, the ammonia, basically all the other molecules Ed mentions where we needed to split them into their elements. It's the exact same formula for all of them, so I'm saving you a lot of time watching me plug in numbers into my calculator. The magic of editing. Let's fast forward, shall we? I asked the ladies to make saltpeter for gunpowder. You neglected to tell us how saltpeter is made. By treating sodium nitrate with potassium chloride, of course. Hey, now we have all our elements. Oh, but they're still in moles. I hate moles moles. Except for yours, Cindy Crawford. So to get back to grams, we just reverse our equation from before, except now we're doing it by the elements. And what do we have to show for it? Well, for one, a really, really solid reason why hardly anyone has ever called into question the full metal formula before. I mean, who? Who is nerdy enough to do this sort of thing? But more importantly, we have all the masses of the elements Ed plans to use to create a human being. Before we compare that to the real world list, though, did you make it through all the math? Congratulations, good job! Here's a hamster eating a carrot under a blanket as a reward. See? Learning is fun. So with that hamster's carrot snack properly chewed, it's finally time to compare the mass of each element from the series versus the mass of each element as it actually appears in the human body. You can see that there are a few elements that manage to come close. Phosphorus and sodium are probably our closest, within 10% of the actual mass found in a human body, so that's not too shabby. But then things start to go downhill from there. The worst offenders are actually potassium and silicon, where they're off by anywhere between 50 and 300 percent And there's all kinds of ranges in between. Sulfur's off by more than half. Chlorine's way off. A ton of these aren't even close. But that begs the question, does any of this matter? What would this actually do if we were trying to create a human using these materials? Well, I hate to break it to you, but it actually matters a lot. 300% of normal fluorine levels would make your bones and teeth super brittle. Having half the amount of sulfur you need would cause a whole rainbow of symptoms, from acne to arthritis to memory loss. Because both hydrogen and oxygen Oxygen are both 25 to 35 percent too low, we know there's a lot of water missing. In fact, it's so low that whatever version of Ed and Al's mom they create would be incredibly dehydrated, possibly to the point that her systems wouldn't even function to begin with. And with about 70 percent of her potassium missing, it's likely that her heart would never even start beating because potassium is one of the key elements that cause electrical potential in your heart and nerves. Literally the chemical that makes your heart run. The bottom line is that even from the very beginning, Ed and Al were starting out with an alchemic formula that doesn't equal a human. It's like trying to make bread with a recipe for spaghetti, or I don't know, something else that's definitely not bread. The proportions are just wrong. It's no wonder they created this monstrosity. That half-formed human is probably the best they could do using the materials they had. They were nowhere close to having the elements necessary to make a complete person. Forget souls, at the end of the day, the thing holding them back the most had nothing to do with the Philosopher's Stone or their knowledge of taboo alchemy, it had to do with their own math. Every time Ed recites that formula in all those episodes, he's not reminding himself of his mother, he's ruining any chance of her ever existing again. And that, loyal theorists, is why you always measure twice and transmute your dead mother once. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. You know how equivalent exchange is all about trading one thing for another? Well, screw that! You can break the laws of equivalent exchange right now by transmuting your way to a one-month free trial of unlimited ad-free HD anime with Crunchyroll. Not the sushi, the anime streaming service. Just
Just use the link in the description or type in crunchyroll.com slash matpat. It's like your personal philosopher's stone. You give up nothing and in exchange you get 30 days of free unlimited anime streamed straight to your desktop, tablet, Xbox, PlayStation, Wii U, Android, iPhone, Roku, and Roku. It says it twice in the talking points, which is funny, since I'm sure like 0.2% of you actually use a Roku. Like if you're accidentally gonna repeat something, at least let it be one of the things that people under the age of 40 actually use. Anyway, I'm still admittedly a bit of a noob to anime, so Crunchyroll has been a great service, allowing me to catch up on all the shows you've been requesting I do theories on, like Hunter x Hunter and Kill la Kill, while also giving me the chance to revisit some of my childhood favorite shows like Digimon and Sailor Moon. And that said, I'm currently looking for new anime to theorize about. So shatter the laws of alchemy, get a free trial by clicking the link in the description, and then let me know in the comments what series you want me to theorize about next. And look, you didn't even need a transmutation circle to do it. Someone should tell the homunculi about this deal. Anyway, if you'll excuse me, I need to catch up on Digimon Frontier, which everyone tells me is the best season and happens to be the one that I missed. So I'm gonna go watch that now. See you next week!